you know? So what? Could be coincidence that Bach's fugue in E major from Book 2 of the Well-Tempered Clavier is in fact um, originally written by Caspar Fischer in Ariane Musique. So what? That um, Beethoven's pathetic <coughs> slow movement is uh, quoting without mentioning it, naturally. The middle section of the C minor Mozart sonata slow movement for piano. So what? The first sonata by Beethoven ascending staccato arpeggios of six fourth chord and the finale of the 40th symphony by Mozart. Coincidences. And so does it matter? And if it's quotations, or perhaps simply learning on the spot? Today is very different. We have more books to study from, articles to read, musicological systems to analyze, plethora of different ways to describe the motions, uh, harmonic, melodic, the thematic, stylistic, of so many uh, genres and styles of music. By the time people finish postdoctorate and PhDs in uh, music knowledge, performance informed uh, early music techniques of reading, of performing, of um, understanding the intent and the tradition, tempo articulation phrasings, or just pure analytical organization of the structures in terms of the form and the mathematical equations almost of the uh, portions, proportions, and um, hmm. all kinds of thoughts like that that I throw here in the air because I'm confronted with them daily when I teach. And I find it fascinating. And um, mostly fascinating when revealed to the student. Oh, it's not like revealing something hidden. It's just um, connecting dots. Bringing to understand that um, the way music was taught in the past, when life expectation was so short, We'll never have the late works of a Schubert, Mendelssohn, or Chopin, to name a few, alas, only, but so many more. And in a way, they gathered their trade by copying the works of others. You could say that was the case of painters, Renaissance and before, and um, in fact, uh, Bach did that, orphan, thrown to the different homes of his cousins and uncles as a child. He learned his trade from their organist's books by copying the scores and learning in the making of the copying, how it's done. And then, of course, here is the unbelievable added value of their melodic, harmonic, colorization, melodic storytelling, this fountain of creativity, even if entirely coated in craftsmanship, it remains intuitively amazing. Granted, they didn't uh, analyze music of other styles than theirs because they had little access to the music of their past and inevitably none of their future. And so, but we do. So perhaps our own present today is much less spread in the teaching in general, not in particular places, but in general. Uh, 
I teach mostly dead composers to young um, artists who um, listen to dead performers of YouTube and other recordings to uh, manage to imagine what am I supposed to bring out and what is the tempo of the articulation and what about the pedaling and and you enter in the knowledgeable ways of um, explaining the choices you have to do instrumental fingerings articulations the importance of tuning in the past for the emotional content of their dissonances used for the sense of uh, lament like in um, Louis Couperin's uh, F sharp minor Pavane with the ton de chèvre on the C sharp major chord arrival. So the type of devices for emotional expression were way more subtle and beyond only the piano and forte of the instrument that carries its name. I, by the way, anecdotically, I like to joke nobody calls anybody a fortist, but a pianist, but not all pianists play soft. Obviously, if the expression is mainly in the dynamic contrast, which the early fortepiano in the early 19th century fascinated Beethoven in a symphonic way with the straight string instruments that um, brought in orchestral timbres almost to the different ranges versus the more modern pianos, which with a cross strung system and uh, resonance by sympathy allows to have some sort of homogenized resonance surrounded sound on all ranges. Abandoning the subtlety of the articulation, the uneven playing, the jeu inégal, the bleeding, um, the fingering without thumb, or the thumb used on another keyboard while playing on another harpsichord keyboard, which attributed to Bach, but not only, obviously. The tuning of the well-tempered system that uh, uh, Silverman, Bach's friend and Bach friend's organ maker, builder, shrunk those major thirds that created these beautiful mean tone tunings on the harpsichord and allowed for amazing um, expressions to these um, tiny bits of um, waves of pure major thirds, slightly bigger than the octave or the unison. Granted, you couldn't play in every key um, or tonality or modulate in every tonality when you were playing in a harpsichord tune on a specific key. And to obtain the unison, therefore chromatic from chroma in Greek, um, then inevitably unisons had to be all the same on each semitone. Hence the well-tempered tuning. And that homogenization of the sounds um, must have been also something to go with the uh, homogenization of the um, of the pitch tuning. The decision of an international A at 440, give or take 30, 50, for orchestral reasons, the higher pitch gives the sense of brightness and more tension in the strings and more orchestral um, colorization. Of course, the opposite also is more mellow when it's a little bit lower. It doesn't change much because it's between the quarter tone and um, not really most people hearing it. Of course, trained hearings hear it, but that doesn't matter because Bach, assumedly, I don't know, had perfect pitch, but the instruments at the time were tuned. If, for instance, in Leipzig, the organs he played for his trade were tuned almost at a third distance. So what did it mean to write a pretty fugue in C minor if it was in A minor in one church or in E minor in another? Was that a relative pitch? Could he, could he adjust and adapt to it? That was the purpose of perfect pitch then, to define a specific 
pitch uh, out of all the others or just the relativity with the interval on any of those pitches? A lot of questions here that I often think about that in a way are connected in the way we hear perceive music, the quality of a piano tuning. If today a tuner tunes the piano slightly up and octaves up and down from the center, you have that sense of bigger depth um, than if it's tuned exactly by the unisons of the octave on each um, octave range. And then it implements on the timbre quality of the sound that um, could be reminiscent of an orchestration where after all the orchestrator at the get-go before the performance um, chooses the timbres, the colors if you want, the tastes or whatever um, analogies, um, colorization versus if the piano sound being singly piano um, is an instrument, not as a dynamic range obviously, it would be more like light and shades, black and white photography, and the orchestra would be the colorization, which gives you 3D depth, um, entertains your ear and enhances the emotions, uh, the warmth of a strings, or the piercing warmth of an oboe solo, if chosen compared to a clarinet solo, or versus a flute solo, or um, so on. The brass, the woodwinds, the strings as groups with the percussions. So the orchestration, it's already the voicing and the interpretational choices of what you bring out on the piano. But on the modern piano with a longer decay than the piano forte, not to mention the harpsichord, but also acoustically used in concert halls where you project further, even if nowadays more and more the recordings replace concert going, but in comparison, chamber music was heard literally in salons or in mansions and uh, balance was not meant towards the group of instruments, piano winds or piano strings, uh, for instance, or just strings playing towards an audience because the audience was circulating around the musicians. Okay, they were entertaining the parties, but nevertheless, Mozart reading a quartet he just composed uh, with Van Hal on the cello from Bohemian, um, the uh, patron playing uh, the second violin of a part uh, designed for the occasion, or the so-called reading music instead of rehearsing music or performing music. Therefore, the projection of the sound didn't matter as much. Chopin and the salons didn't have to project in front of a big hall and have a big sound, regardless of the instruments he played, because there was a list, was the first one to inaugurate more of these with um, oh, many of his um, competitors of the time, the concert um, presentation, which was sort of a extravagant for the time, Extra, extrovertness. So the reading of the music became the performing, the rehearsing, then the um, interpretation separated from the composition when all the interpreters were composers by trade, since that's what they learned by copying music of others, to provide music to the patrons. And never occurred to anybody to ask Chopin to play Goldberg Variation or a Beethoven Sonata at the Salon or Liszt was the first one, to, well not only, but among the first ones to promote music of others either because of his son-in-law Wagner's opera and the uh, fundraising for the um, uh, opera house building in Bayreuth um, then playing transcriptions and paraphrases or then the genre of the operatic bel canto imitation of the piano with theme and variations from famous arias of operas. Paraphrasing. So interpretation was in fact in global recreating to the point to which composers started believing inevitably that an interpretation is a betrayal. 
So when we teach it from the dead composer's point of view to the young students, and we have to um, define the framework in which they can develop their own creativity for which it means to them to play, not just to express their own musicianship over it, but within. And as my teacher would say, if you don't like it, write your own piece. But then that's what they all did in the past. Von Bülow premiering the Liszt Sonata and the Tchaikovsky Concerto. Two major works of the Romantic piano literature to be the least to say. But um, it was accepted that the performer was co-composing. Bach's teaching the inventions he composed for his students and children was not expecting them to bring them to the lesson to play them as written on the score. They had to copy it for their next lesson since there was no scores to purchase, but they were expected inventio, the pedagogical aspect of Bach's teaching, to make their own perhaps improvise their own two-voice, uh, perhaps three-voice polyphony. Contrary emotions, imitations. Mozart improvising his concerti in the Sunday afternoon uh, subscription concerts in Vienna's park, writing eight bars at a time on a horizontal page at the time um, of orchestra, um, woodwind, brass, and very little, but minimal, let's say, horns and trumpet and, um, of course, the woodwind quintet and the string quintet, played with the chamber group and the musicians who would play in it would copy it in real time while they had a party and he was, just, he was asked, don't you write any um, drafts? He would say, no, I don't do sketches. I dictated me directly dictation from God provocateur or just sincere but at levels that makes people think hey he's arrogant of course it's easier to say when it's so misunderstanding it's not even comprehensible that um, he could come up with such a subtleties depths and lightnesses at the same time and the score without the piano part that he improvised conducting from the piano on the Sunday afternoon uh, um, subscription concerts in Vienna. And then when the publisher Artaria asked him for the score after a successful concerto and which one wasn't, he would then later add the piano part or write it rather for the publishing. So we can argue about the details of the notes, of the intents. Perhaps he had more time, or perhaps he just uh, filled it up quickly. But it wasn't what he improvised. So was it less? Was it more elaborate? Was it more subtle, less subtle? But when you know concerti like the C or the D minor, even today, after all these rehearsals have been done for so many generations of people studying these repertoires, and um, rehearsal um, instrumental competitions and schools and everybody knows the style of Mozart. We still need so many rehearsals to bring it up to what the conductor's taste would be expected to be matched for um, the bowing, the system of um, um, breathing, the articulation of the um, woodwinds, um, notes and then how it matches with the piano as uh, uh, enhanced um, decoration to the woodwinds in the um, Masonic music style in the three flats, three sharps uh, symbolism of Holy Trinity but always so subtle in the D minor opening with the syncopations and the double basses on the triplets and they did it according to um, Mozart's father who horrified according to his letter to relative um, describes how Wolfi didn't even try on the piano the concerto he just wrote, it must have been 1785, he was visiting and he attended this performance of um, the premiere of the D minor concerto without rehearsal as he mentions it in his letter. So it must have been not that bad or inaudible because after all hence even today, with all the publishers uh, uh, and republished and uh, musicologically uh, edited by great um, 
uh, scholars, we still have discrepancies in scores and parts, uh, chromaticism, major, minor, something that escapes the attention of the proofreader has to be fixed in the rehearsal between the conductor and then the orchestra and, and sometimes not. But anyway, when it was sight read, it means that the musicians who were composers by trade in their individual instruments probably corrected in real time what they were reading. Of course, the style was universally the same for all, so it wasn't like they were playing one week Voulez and Stravinsky, next week Mozart. But between Beethoven's concerti after Mozart, like Mozart C minor concerto, and then later Beethoven C minor concerto, similarities in evolution. Beethoven using the scales, the three first notes of the first themes, first notes, and then the system of adding a coda with the piano after the cadenza in the first movement that Mozart introduced. He used it too. He played the D minor as a young student in Vienna, not the C minor, of the two minor key of the 27 Mozart concerti. And even his own cadenza for the D minor of Mozart was already out of the style of Mozart within the same time period, but nevertheless, it was the generally common communal musical alphabet, or so to say, tonal system language of the so-called first Viennese school, Papa Haydn there. Anecdotically, I always find it so touching that it's a rare case where the composer Haydn, who was, so to say, the teacher of Mozart, though I doubt that Mozart had to learn much, but nevertheless um, an admirer as an elder because he saw in him his prodigal son, his spiritual son, so to say. And, um, and not at all in Beethoven. Well, he misread Beethoven because Beethoven Young was not either very cooperative as a student of Haydn, to say the least. But that said, the point is, is that it's a rare case where Haydn surviving Mozart, which in those days when people died so young from all kinds of diseases, um, Haydn lived extremely longly and probably in emotional sorrow very deeply so after Mozart's um, passing, going to England to attend Strauss, uh, one of his students' wedding, and um, composing on these Broadwood pianos where he was housed across of the factory of the symphonic instrument he describes it compared to the Stein or the um, Viennese um, Streicher for the pianos that he was familiar with. In combined all that instrumental uh, capacity with the pedal on the knee and that allows to even make more resonance than the articulation of the early pianofortes. I think there is a difference of style in Haydn's late works after Mozart, as if the, the elder, the master, was um, inspired by the meteorite young Mozart, who came by and left. I think Haydn um, must have really found, I mean, of course, all of Haydn is incredibly ingenious and organized and witty and deep at the same time. And very, Ravel used to say that he had a portrait in his room in Montfort le Maurice house of Haydn. And when they asked him Maître, why do you have a Haydn portrait in front of you there? And he said, because he always expressed all he had to say within the form. Didn't need to break it or go over board with it. Of course, he also is attributedly the father of the form, at least a symphony or the sonata form into the quartets and all different genres, but from that form with two opposite themes, development recap for internalization for the second theme. Well, if it's principal minor, not always. Sometimes it brings another subtlety to the whole system. But nevertheless, Beethoven goes from writing in the almost early 1800s, 
20 or so years before the marketing in Vienna by Meltzel of the metronome, sonatas, which until his death will be 32, all on the fortepiano directly, not harpsichord or forte playable on the fortepiano, like J.C. Bach, the last Bach um, son composer from London after Handel took him under his wing, after Bach died. Um, even communicated to Mozart, child prodigy, his own um, sonatas, opus 6 and 12, and Mozart immediately even child transformed them into piano concerti, and again like Bach for um, Fischer or um, Beethoven for Mozart, he didn't even quote that. He literally stated the concerti as what was said from the sonatas of J.C. Bach, you can say when you hear it, it sounds like Mozart. When you hear Beethoven, you hear late Mozart, sounds like Beethoven, which is kind of awkward, <coughs> since obviously chronologically the influence is the other way. But regardless, as I said in the beginning, I was always thinking, is a communal expression of musical um, trade, know-how, Imitation in contrapoint, but also imitation among composers with slight alterations in the tonal system, but never leaving it, at least not until a little later in that 19th century, early 20th. And yet, with these communal rules of the game, they composed such a personal pieces in terms of their expression of their own melodicity combined to their own organization of the tonal model system and whichever they chose to coat their fountain of musical creativity after which the interpretation of today away from their time period, outside of um, the way of learning so differently today, where performers perform, composers compose, theoreticians theoretize, musicologists musicologize, music historians, etc. And um, yeah, the translation, literally the meaning of the word interpretation becomes uh, an oeuvre within the oeuvre. A piece of the piece itself. Oh, I prefer to hear this Chopin sonata by so and so rather than by another one. And then the concept of the original text, regardless if we have access to it or plethora of them with Chopin copying three times for different publishers in Germany, England and France, or others like the Chromatic Fantasy Lost or by Bach in terms of manuscript, or most works come to us by copies of copies of students of students. So yeah, there is this desire for authenticity, many after World War II with the Urtext concept by Henley and then Vienna Urtext and uh, not to mention uh, Berenweiter. And that's commendable because it gives to students the uh, pre-cooked meal. They don't have to go through uh, reading through them existing facsimiles of manuscripts and compare and check a detail and see did Liszt really do a, in his sonata in one of the bars um, a new harmonic A flat G sharp um, chromatic sequence or did he go a natural as um, Urtext editions write then when you look at the facsimile of handwriting there is no a natural same with the second partita of 1731 handwritten edition of Bach's time where um, there are so many discrepancies for the forgotten um, naturals to clear up um, the accidentals, if it were, or they are implemented, or rather implied, and then implemented in the performance because of the keyboard harmony knowledge of Baroque music written down up, melodic bass, the continuo. So therefore, the knowledge of the composers, performers of the time was a bit like continuist for the Baroque, accompanying arias for cantatas or operas or recitativos, 
or uh, jazz musicians today um, playing from um, charts or by ear improvisations on variations on tunes after they heard them by great other jazz performers but the written text of the classical music even if the term doesn't refer to the style since romantic is also classical neoclassical is classical modern uh, postmodern etc in other words the written score becomes after world war ii the antidote to all the buzonis and lists earlier and many more um, who uh, flourished the pieces they played to the point to which people like Ravel said I want to be performed or played not interpreted or Stravinsky considered interpretation a betrayal purely that translation and when the teacher is the hyphen between the dead composer and the student yeah we have to give argumentation about it before the metronome we thought andante meant just the walk compared to adagio it meant at ease but then after Meltzel's metronome who organized when he uh, marketed it adagio slower than andante with a certain amount of beats a minute and even so we don't always play it like it's indicated nor more than conductors do it for Beethoven symphonies where he retroactively in the last years of his life owning a metronome marked the tempi of his symphonies unfortunately not for his sonatas so for piano we are still back into the post-baroque way of just assuming from the tempo from the choice of the meter and the is it in 16, in 8? Is it by uh, units of quarter notes or half notes? Do we hear the bar lines when we, we hear the music? Of course not. Are they used there mostly for orchestral or group rehearsal purposes? Because it's easier to stop and start at a given practice than to um, have very long melodic structured phrases, bar lines, which could take 12 to 24 beats or more even if they're indicative of the direction of the line and the notation of slow movements in Viennese school with 16th note and 32nd subdivided slower than the quarter notes of the first movement and then a last movement very fast or a scherzo before a last movement which would be a rondo and sometimes theme and variations but notated very fast tempo but in very slow values with short group of um, many group of short bars until Schumann in the Carnival Opus 9 starts changing a meter in the middle of the opening um, statement of the preamble when after that uh, early 20th century many composers like Stravinsky would even change the meter every bar because in a way the Russian music is without the beat so one to one to one to three, one to three for one to one to one to three. It's always a one, 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 one. It becomes a pulse, ta ta, ta ta ta. You can subdivide it one to one to one to three into five sixteen, seven sixteen, three eight, two four. But the music of the Western, um, let's say, Baroque into modern times was mostly upbeat to downbeat. Ta da 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 da, ta da dum ta da dum ta da ti da, ta 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 ti, ta 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 ti. You arrive downbeat. You start a beat, and you're constantly connecting then the next. Ta -da -da -ti -ta 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 -ti -ta -ta -ta. So you have a sense like in Bach to three for one by the sixteenth notes of four on the beat, but to three for one, to three for one, to three for one into a perpetual motion. Then of course you can make articulations according to the tradition of the bows of the time with two slur, two dot. Ta ya ta ta ti ya ta 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 ta. Then with Brahms and many other composers of the Romantic era, you have the hemiolas. And already with Mozart especially, oh my god. Which overlap, stretch or retract and uh, or enhance the pulse and um, give a different pacing and creating through the harmonic rhythmic progression, a rhythmic accelerando, a feel for a up 
lifting or build up of anxiety in the chain syncopations of a Schumann, also related to the German syntax in that case in part, in my opinion, because of the verb at the end of the sentence. So a suspense with delayed resolution. Oh, the Russian music where the um, tonic uh, accent is all the time exhaling, so to say, on the first syllable of the word, Bozhimoy, oh my God, in Russian. And so very often all the Rachmaninoff pieces, Tchaikovsky very often, are all downbeat thematic materials. Mozorovsky's pictures too, even when they portray Western um, paintings like in Paris set uh, for the pictures. But Russian style, downbeatish. Perhaps all this is not related really to their syntax for the German and the tonic accent in German, I mean in Russian. But in French, um, it's ta 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 ta. And when you set music with uh, lyrics for art songs or arias, you have to start with an upbeat because the accent in French is at the end of the word. Of course, when you adapt rap in French, coming from the Bronx with the beat and the rhythm and the English language that is more heavy on the first syllable. Then they deform the French language to fit that beat, writing French poetic rap in the language of every country, actually, there are raps. But when you used to um, set the music according to the language, even if it without lyrics, like for Schumann's non-art songs, you still feel that there is this syncopation of the German um, suspension expectation for the verb is the tense, present, past or future, and you don't know it until you get to it, so you expect it. And there is a longing and an anxiety and excitement and expectation in the expression of romanticism breaking the form and expressing so much of the inner individuality of the Western civilization in Europe. And um, a lot of the romantic era music in a ballad by Chopin or in a piece by uh, Schumann or Liszt is about longing, expecting, with anxiety or with desire, or with build up of um, um, excitement or with the build up of emotional um, bursts, like in Tchaikovsky or Dvorak or irony and tragedy with Prokofiev and Stravinsky with a certain neoclassicism and then into dodecophonism after and with after having not fallen Schoenberg in it but he did after music disconnected from emotional content through the dodecophonic system of the serial in general organization of the notes without a direction of a centered whether it be harmonic tonality or punctuation through tension release rapport of triton to uh, release uh, six or third like circle of fifths led to and to the Gregorians already who were avoiding desperately major or minor and therefore the triton of the diminished fifth or the augmented fourth to create that by having only parallel fifths and unisons, the polyphony, the contrary emotions, the development of the motets in the Renaissance, the virtuosity of the voice leading. Thales writing Spermenalium in 40 parts was, wow. Like as if you say to somebody today, you know, how fast you've played the code of the fourth ballad. If you're a pianist, because it's instrumental and when the music was mostly church music uh, related to the motets, uh, to the tradition of the singing the music. At all time periods, when you observe things, you can say that the notation was temporarily freezing, but not fully the intent of the composer, either because of tradition of notation, like second partida opening in Bach, there is no dot on the 
eighth note rest, but it was traditional that you didn't dot the rest when you dotted the value of a note, but not the value of the rest. So you could play ta pam pa pa, but in fact it was supposedly played ta ram ta da, but not notated as such. So are we betraying it because we read it textually and render it, or then we read it and we render it according to the tradition we are taught uh, when we research towards uh, understanding the performance practice of the time, reading the essay by C.P. Bach about the performance of the keyboard and the fingerings without the thumb, or Bach using the two keyboards with the thumb, in fact, most of the time, on the harpsichord, passing on the same note that he's holding, even if the decay doesn't hold it so much, which on the piano, on the single keyboard, becomes so complicated, like you walk over your toes musically. But you hear the voices, and of course you play one if it is a three-voice fugue or four. The outer voice is obviously with the two hands, outer, left, right, but then the inner voice or inner voices shared between the two hands. So you have to think of it as a virtual third hand or fourth hand. You have to write it on score staves and sing and play and never hear vertically the horizontalization, horizontal layering of the voices and their and the pulses also matter a lot. That's why in the notation of the handwritings of Bach, there is this stem for each note of each chord, even if there are many notes in the chord. So do we arpeggiate it to imitate the harpsichord on the piano? Because on the piano, hammered instrument versus the plucked on the harpsichord, it's more effective to play it all together. Do we voice uh, the fugue with um, dynamic ranges which allow us to overextensively demonstrate the entrance of a subject, contra subject, or the answer? Or do we just blend it in as it was meant? Or at least Bach on the organ could have the long decay, but on the harpsichord he didn't, but didn't stop him from writing as if he was not limited by, or thoughtfully didn't give the impression that other that he was writing absolute music, regardless if it's vocal, instrumental, secular, or church, even if, of course, his is mostly very much Lutheran, naturally. But um, Mozart's operas and Mozart's um, masses, or requiem, of course, have a lot of communality in the expression and same with Verdi's Requiem and his operas and all these thoughts seem so thrown in the air like that unconsequential, unorganized, unchapterized, un 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 um, cr cr uh, chronologically placed but I believe that there is a purpose to it is because just like in the beginning, I was saying that some composer seems to have stolen from another composer, to call it as it is. I think um, more than the serendipitous situations of that case, here and there, that can be proven or not, that's not the point. It's the communality is... Um, I think the common language, the evolution of the tonal system, they didn't have time to think about it too much because they had to survive. And so perhaps um, that saved them. But at the same time, today we have the luxury for those of us who do to um, learn so much from the past. Striking. And the various pasts so we have to define a style for an interpretation of an instrument which is not composed for ears who didn't hear it the way it is, tunings that were not used for it, expressions that are perhaps most likely over-expressive or over-stated compared to the, what was the style expectation of the performance acoustically, socially, interactingly, rehearsing, practicing, learning, uh, performing career making of interpretations, no more composing pianists um, or violinists or flutists, or very rarely, um, 
not so much music theory learning in the past, like reading in the clefs first because of ledger lines, which didn't allow to put enough um, staves on the score when the paper was so rare. Or then um, because of that, um, the capacity to read um, transposing instruments on the orchestral score. So today, even to accompany, you don't have to, if a singer needs another range um, of, um, for the tonality of a given art song, you can have it printed or published in every key that you need. Mid how low voice. Hmm. Sometimes I feel like from the way I was um, brought up for those grammatic musical grammar things by Mademoiselle Boulanger, Mademoiselle Dieudonné and all this um, end of 19th century ladies in the 20th century where um, as a young child I received uh, the know-how and my parents sacrificed so much for me to be able to learn the clefs when today people don't use them. At least they don't learn them and if they do just for their trade, if you're a violist obviously, the C third line and if you play cello or bassoon you learn the C fourth line for the high notes again because of the ledgerized notation but Whatever the rules, whatever the reasons, whatever the causes, the musicianship, the trade, the learning from the copying of the score to learn how to compose it, from today's concepts to learn from teachers and textbooks and um, variety of options to analyze a single piece, let less different styles. And it seems like you'll never have enough time to learn all if you're interested in it archaeologically into music. And when you deal with the same piece, the length of a lifetime as a performer, a singer in an opera or chamber musician or whatever, every time you revisit the piece, you discover more things that it keeps giving. And when you teach it too, regardless how much you don't go there to just teach the way you know it, you think it is, and that's it. The door is locked. No. You discover that these young people come to it with their own intuition, which is stronger than perhaps um, your own scholarship knowledge of the piece. And you have to accept it. It doesn't mean that it's always working that way, but you have to be open to it. If not, it feels like even if it's an untold exchange, there is an exchange. Even if it's asymmetrical between the knowledge and the experience of the teacher and the student who is trying to gather it in this teacher and this other teacher and build their own inner mosaic that becomes their own self. The process, some got lost because perhaps they get too much information. It's so contradictory. Music can, same piece can mean so many different things to so many different people. But art historians also differ and uh, scientists differ so about their own uh, trade and their specifics. So why not classically trained musicians as they used to call them? And I think improvisation is part of the performance but today it's not allowed. So therefore it's not expected. It would be unfair and would be unrespectful to give it as an incentive to students because then they'll be unfairly judged uh, in auditions, examinations, competitions, uh, job competitions. Of course, once they're established in their domain of musicianship, and they can create perhaps their own new editions, and they can bring back some tradition of how it used to be played, at that point they will be revered their scholars and when they would do the same thing as students they would be considered not doing what's written not supposed to have been taught rigorously rigor is the ties that unbound um, create creativity within the piece but you first have to teach the discipline without which there is no of course technique for artistry and um, a lot of discipline for technique but not as an end by itself. 
So you read Accelerando, Ritenuto, or Rubato on a score, and then you see the harmonic progression tempo, and you realize that perhaps you don't have to add to it. How much do you comment? The improvisation? No. The interpretation? No. The reading? No. The um, reciting, recitation of the piece? Let the piece happen by itself. If the composer chose in a harmonic modulation like Schubert, you don't need to make perhaps a dynamic range contrast. But if you do, then it's enhancing it. And perhaps sometimes your intuition calls you to, and the teacher can say it's not on the score, but then you can say, but I feel it. So do you play your comment over the piece while playing it? Or do you respect the piece craftsmanship-like and not artistry-like rewriting it? Rethinking it, reimagining it. Where is the limit? Who defines the good taste about uh, Rubato or not in the competition with jury members, imminent as they are, and um, disagreeing on everything? Except that there is a charismatic performance of a given candidate that, for the different opinions, point of view of the different type of um, musicianships that are in the different performers in the jury, they agree to disagree, or rather to accept this transcendence of the presence of a, in a young artist who brings something charismatically very intense or meaningful or even truthful sounding. And that will be the next generation people who will bring um, their own reading through their interpretation uh, with their own personality and regardless if it's misunderstood in the eyes of some purists or in other purists, it's, a, it's an eternal rediscovery. The material of the written text, in fact, remains so lively. So much can be done with it, out of it. And those who are the self-proclaimed experts, guardians, of their trade for a specific um, style. Yeah, you can revere them and you will, and you want to imitate them and you might, and then after that you might go beyond. Be yourself.